So come along, support the girls. Let's get, give a round of applause for everyone that's going to be involved. Amen. Amen. It's going to be a great time. We're going to win. Amen. We also have a conference coming up. A fantastic time every year. You know, I, I can't say good enough words about this. If you come along, you will be blessed. It will change your life. So please, you know, come along, ask us about it. If you need a lift, speak to me or Pastor Yan, and I'm sure uh, we can arrange something for you. Amen? Amen. And I believe that is it for the announcement. So could I have a clap up, and that's how I should come up. Amen. So the reading is from Matthew 6, 31 to 33. And it says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So there's three aspects of this scripture. Right? The first being not to worry. Because God knows that we tend to worry in this world. Right? We tend to worry about tomorrow, about the things that we need. But he goes on to say there's a reason not to worry. Number one, because God knows what you need. He knows. And number two, because he's attached a promise that as you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things that you need will be added to you. You know, so there's many ways to seek first the kingdom of God. And one such way is in your tithes and offering. So, you know, I encourage you, you know, we all have things that we're, that we know that we need. And God knows that you need them. So seek first his kingdom and those needs will be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. And I have every eye closed and every head bowed. Amen. And I'm just going to bless every gift and every giver. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, for your blessing upon every gift and every giver. Lord, you have uh, put this promise in your word that as we seek first your kingdom, you will add everything that we need to us. Therefore, Lord God, in every area of our life, Lord God, we pray that we'll seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord God, knowing that you shall add what we need to our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm trading my shame. I'm in the bell. If you want to roll and go like that, you 
won't come back. That's why it's forget that they don't know that death is a trip with a one way ticket. Not to get with it. Break on bitch, you make it back fidget. If you knew what, then you would just live it. There was a liar making out with it. Man's heart is wicked, not to get with it. Walk with the Lord like Jesus did. Walk with the Lord like Elijah did. Pray for the rain like Elijah did. I see the clouds, hands of a man, let me handle it back. If you know what, you can handle it back. Get to a man, tell him about God. Walk in the day, we're standing on. We know the pain, came as a man, so we know the shame. Then when he came, the fight is rest. We all are poor. Through the storm, I will be still. Know his voice, heard his voice. It's a choice to follow him. We walk on top. Sometimes we can uh, get ourselves or even other people hurt from getting involved in situations that have nothing to do with yeah. us. Sometimes we can get ourselves uh, involved in certain situations that, and we're the ones that are left with scars and the situation has nothing to do with us. Mm. See, but it's a whole other thing when you're fatally wounded in a situation that has nothing to do with you. And this is what we're going to be looking at in our text. We're going to be looking at a, 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 a king that had went out into a situation, into battle, had nothing to do with him, but yet he ends up paying the ultimate price. Second Chronicles 35, 20, if I can get that read out, 20 to 24. Came out to fight against Tarsus, 
Pardon me, you wrote for me. Have your head out into the heat and great distances and to spiral out gently. Any faint messages to soothe me in pain, what I hide to do with you, be a few words. I have not come against you this day, as the gate of how I have been. The gods commanded me to make haste. Refrain from the wind, gods. Who is with me? Nevertheless, the sire would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and did not heed the words of Nico from the mouth of God, for he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. Yes. Mm. And the gods were stretched in his way, and he was doing so for a time, fifteen years, and to be in the years. He showed his face and stretched him out of that time, and he was in the earth and stretched out his hand. He was in his hand, but still he died, and the gods were doing so. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray, church. Father, I pray right now, Jesus, that you uh, meet with us, that you speak <coughs> into our hearts. Lord, I ask, you know, open heart, oh God. Lord, uh, that you soften uh, and go before us, oh Jesus. Speak a word in season to your saints, Lord. Let us uh, leave, oh Jesus, uh, with, a, with a mindset, God, to continue to live for you in, in the right way, God. Let us focus, God, upon what we need to do as Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to speak about, first and foremost, the dangers of the battlefield. You see, the, the life of a Christian is a battlefield. Where we're constantly, uh, where we're constant, we're constantly in and out of battle, should I even say. Always, there's, there's always some sort of battle that's going on. You know, whether it's in our mind, we're thinking about the past, uh, names that people have called us, words that people have said to us, things that we regret that we should have done, things that we regret that we shouldn't have done or shouldn't have got ourselves involved in. There's always some sort of battle that's going on in our minds. And also, even on the outside, there's things or the people that we're battling with as well. Friends, family members, our kids at times as well. There's people that we are constantly battling with. And there's always something that we've got to battle for or against. You know, someone once said, the Christian life is not a playground, but a battlefield of spiritual warfare. The closer we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we advance into the front line of conflict. This is the sobering reality that confronts every believer. No Christian can afford to be ignorant of the threatening schemes of spiritual combat, not when so dangerous an enemy is seeking the destruction of our faith. It is critical that we will that we be well informed regarding Satan who prowls about as a, roar, as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You know, the, the dangers of the battlefield, church, is that, hey, you know, there's always something or someone that's going to try and take away our faith. There's always something or someone that's going to try and disrupt us. You know, from the moment that we get saved, the moment that we give our lives to Jesus, we become an opposition of, yeah. of, of the devil. From the moment that we say, hey, you know what, God, I'm going to live for you. That is when the devil starts scheming. That's when the devil starts planning. You know, you might say to yourself, you come to church and you might say to yourself, I'm going to live for God. And as soon as you walk out those doors, there's something or someone that turns you or deters you from living for God. Yeah. You know, I remember a, a football player named Fernando Torres. He played for Liverpool. He was a, a, a great footballer. You know, he scored a lot of goals for Liverpool. And then uh, as, as he's scoring those goals, all the Liverpool fans, they, they celebrated, they, they cheered him, they, they used to idolise him and worship him. And then as soon as he signed for Chelsea, they hated him. As soon as he signed for Chelsea, they said to themselves, you know what, this guy is X'd off from our, from, from our history, he's X'd off from, from, from all the idols, all the worshipping. Straight away, he becomes an opposition. You know, I remember that day that he signed for Chelsea, actually. I remember outside the, Anfield, the, the Liverpool Stadium, they burnt his football top because they saw him no, no longer as someone that was worshipped or idolised, but someone as an enemy in opposition. And that's the way that the devil sees us. As soon as we make a decision for Christ, you're in opposition. You are someone that the devil says, hey, you know what? You're against me now. Yeah. I'm going to do everything that I can possibly do to still kill and destroy your future. I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to devastate you. Yeah. See, there's two things that the, the, the devil uses to contribute to his strategies and his plans. And the first thing is 
this world. You know, this world is continually creating systems and laws to go against what God desires for our lives. Yeah. You know, I, I remember watching a video uh, not too long ago. It was about a man that was talking about human rights or women's rights even. So he's speaking to these different people and he's asking them, hey, you know what, um, how would you, uh, how do you feel about women's rights? And they said, yeah, yeah, I believe women should have rights. One person even said, I believe women should be running the country. And then I'm thinking, oh, okay, like, th that's the normal, that's the, that's, the, um, that's the society answer, you know, towards those sort of questions. And then the man asks them, you know, so define to me what a woman is. And straight away, they, they, they said, I don't know. They said, I, I can't define what a woman is. You know, this world, funny enough, you know, would always bring us into a place where, where we're constantly asking questions, we're constantly saying different things. But hey, it's going against what God desires for us. And the second thing is our flesh. Our flesh is quite similar. It goes against everything that's godly that we hear preached or that we read about. The reality is, you know, the, most of the stories in the Bible are very interesting stories. You know, David and Goliath. Can we actually believe that it happened? There's many times where, where I've, I've spoken to people and they've said to me, you know, I don't believe that God could have done that. I don't believe that it's our flesh that makes us question. It's our flesh that makes us question whether God can even move in our life, whether God can even transform our life. You know, God's word. Whether read or preached about is true, but our flesh doesn't allow us to believe it. Yeah. Our flesh doesn't allow us to believe whether God's word is true. Second Corinthians 10, 3-4, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. It says that we, we do not. It says that we walk in the flesh so the reality is when we read this scripture it says not just leaders it says not just new believers but everyone every single person here present we war we're in a war every single person here present you're in danger every single person here present you're coming up against the enemy you're coming up against the strategies of the devil every person here present we need to be able to fight we need to be able to fight the right fight. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. The devil is seeking who he's going to destroy. He's, he's going about like a roaring lion. You know, when I read this scripture, I said, I said to myself, why does God, uh, use this word lion in the scripture. Why is, why is the word lion in the scripture? And I was looking at studies of lions, and lions actually spend 20 hours a day resting. They spend 20 hours a day resting. So, everyone do the maths with me. So, how many hours are left in the day? Four hours. Thank you very much. There's four hours that are left in the day. So, they've only got four hours to hunt and kill people. The devil knows he's only got a limited amount of time. The devil knows he's only got a short window for him to get as many people as he can to help. So what is he going to do? He's going to go around. He's going to try and grasp as many people as he can possible. And that is why the scripture says the, de uh, the devil rolls around like a roaring lion because he understands that there's a short amount of time to try and grasp as many people as he can, to try and devour as many people as he can. See, the battlefield church is dangerous. It's a dangerous place. And we don't want to fight, or we don't want to die fighting on the wrong battlefield. Just like Josiah was fighting on the wrong battlefield. First Timothy 6.12, it says, fight the fight, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of witnesses. See here in our scripture, you know, Paul was encouraging Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Why? If you read before, it says, hey, you know, there's going to be false teachers that are going to be out there. There's going to be people that are going to be throwing money at you. There's going to be people that are going to be chasing money. But you've got to fight the good fight of faith. Your faith is what you've got to fight for, church. Your faith is what you've got to, is what you're going to be challenged about. It's something that you need to fight for. 
You know, your faith is always being questioned. Your faith is always something that, that is always going to be uh, questioned. It's always going to be challenged. It's always something that's going to be pulled left to right, different directions. Why? Because it's something that you need to fight for. Without faith, how are you going to live for God? The devil knows. If I take away your faith, if I take away the faith that you have in your life, then there's no way that you can live for God anymore. The devil knows that, hey, the faith that you have, the faith that, it, that God is, is trying to stretch and, and God is trying to grow in your life. If I take that away, if I challenge it, if I cut it away, there's no way that you can live for God. You know, at this point, uh, as we go back into our main text, at this point uh, of Josiah's life, you know, he is at a, a real high pedestal. You know, it, it, there's a background to, to, to this story. The nation of Israel, you know, they were divided uh, north and south. So Israel was Jerusalem one side and Judah on the other. So Josiah, he's, he's the king of, of the Judah kingdom. And as he's leading Judah, you know, he, now he's taken them from a place of idolatry. So they used to worship idols uh, from his grandfather, uh, Manasseh. They used to worship idols. They were in a horrible spiritual state. And now he's bringing them into a place where, hey, you know what? Now we can worship God. There was a fight that he had to, that he had to, uh, that he had to overcome. That he, there was an obstacle that he had to fight against for him to get to this place. In 2 Kings 21, 16 says, Moreover, Manasseh shed every much, very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides his sin by which he made Judah sin, in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, Manasseh, he had sacrificed babies. He had killed all sorts of people. Why? In the name of his idols that he worshipped. And now, uh, Josiah comes along and he says, we're going to get rid of it. We're going to go back to worshipping God. We're going to get rid of all these different things that, we're, that we're, we're, we're fighting against, all these different obstacles, all these different idols, and we're going to go back and we're going to worship God. See, Josiah, he came up against different obstacles that should have killed him, but yet he fought the good fight and he brought salvation back. He brought redemption back to Israel. You know, he devotedly, or he wholeheartedly, should I even say, worshipped God in his life. You know, one man once said, uh, Christianity today, Christianity in our time, we drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards obedience and call it freedom. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. Desire, he wholeheartedly, he held nothing back when he worshipped God. He understood that, hey, you know what, I've got to be single-minded when I'm worshipping God. There's times where we can walk out of the stores, quite similar to what I said on Wednesday. There's times we can walk out and we can, our hearts our minds can be divided in terms of worshipping God. We might say to ourselves, you know what, Monday to Friday I'm going to do my own thing and then Saturday and Sunday I'm going to live a holy life. But that's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to pursue Him from Monday to Sunday. God has called us to be devout to Him from Monday to Sunday. God has called us to be uh, complete rather than uh, uh, partial. You know, God has called us to be genuine and not pretending. There is something about a single-minded person or a single-minded pursuit. That when it comes, when, when, when hard times come, they make no excuses. Mm. They don't go and say, oh yeah, that's what, I'm going to live like this because my grandfather did this. I'm going to live like this because my mother, that's all I know. No. Yeah. God has said, when you're single-minded, there's no excuses. So we walk and we contend and we believe in God. Single-minded pursuit. About 150 years ago, there was a, a revival that broke out in Wales. And the people there, they, they felt so inspired to go and tell people about Jesus. So what they did is, a few people, they went to South India to a place named Assam. And at this place named Assam, uh, many of the villagers there, they, they said they don't want to know about Jesus. 
They said, go back to your country. We don't want to know about this Jesus. But there was this one family that got saved. A man, his wife, and his two children. So they, they, their family, they ended up getting saved. They ended up telling people in their village about Jesus. They ended up witnessing them. A lot of people ended up getting saved. So the chief of that village, he comes to the family and he says, you know what, you guys come outside, we're going to make an example of you. So he brings the whole village out and he brings the family out and he says, hey, renounce Jesus now or I'm going to kill you. And the father says, let me go back to mine because I don't know what the father said. I have decided to follow Jesus. He says, I have decided to follow Jesus. So what the chief does, he brings the two sons and he kills the sons there and there on the floor. And now the sons are there, they're, 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 the dad's watching. Tears are, are coming from his eyes. Mother's there watching, tears are coming from her eyes. And the man says, renounce Jesus. And they said, the world, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. So what the man decides to do, he kills the wife. And now it's just the man, the man, the, the chief says to him, hey, you've lost everything. Renounce Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. No turning back. And that's where we get our song from, actually. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. This man, he ends up dying as well. And what happens is the chief, he goes back to, to wherever he was living and he, he's pondering on what's taking place. And what he decides to do is say, hey, you know, if this man can follow someone to the death that he never knew, that lived over 2,000 years ago, then I might as well do the same. Let me get to know who Jesus is. He gives his life to Jesus. The whole village ended up getting saved. And now, there's a great work that's happening in that place in Assam, as northern in India. Because someone decided not to die on the wrong battlefield, but he died on the right battlefield. <coughs> He died at a place where hey, he was living for God and he focused solely upon Jesus. But the reality is life brings us distractions. It brings us distractions that will bring us to a place where we're fighting on the wrong battlefield. It brings us, to, it brings us distractions that will bring us to a place where we're, where we're fighting for things that shouldn't even matter. Things that we don't even need to get involved in. Things that, hey, you know what we're saying to ourselves, this is really important, but the reality is it's not that important. It's just your pride getting involved. It's just, hey, you know what, this is my family member, that's why I'm involved in this. Dying on the wrong battlefield can be such a tragedy, church. Bitterness will distract us yeah. from fighting the fight that we need to fight. Mm. And it will cause us to die on the wrong battlefield. You know, King Saul was a perfect example of someone that died on the wrong battlefield. King Saul, uh, he, he followed God up until the moment where David came in and he defeated Goliath. And now his, his, his whole priorities had changed. Everything about his life had changed now. And it was uh, something that was made uh, very clear in the scripture. It said that he was bitter towards David and that he was chasing after him for many months or many years even. And then it comes to a place where he brings his army out into battle. God hasn't, hasn't led them into battle, but he says, let's go to battle. Let's go and fight against these people. And what happens is that he, he begins to realize that he's losing the battle. So what he decides to do, he answers his servant, kill me, kill me, stab me right now. And the servant says, I can't do that. So he falls on his own sword, he commits suicide. And his sons and his servants all told die in that battle as well. Simply because he was fighting the wrong fight. Rebellion and disobedience can kill us also on the wrong battlefield. Yeah. Genesis 3, 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed uh, fig leaves together and made themselves covering. 
you know, re rebellious or disobedience. You know, it, it, sometimes we can say to ourselves, oh, it's just a voice that I'm listening to. It's just words. They're not really going to inspire me in some sort of way. But hey, you know what? Just a kiss can bring you to a place as well of dangerous. Just a hug can bring you to a place as well. Just a, a DM, just a text message can bring you to a place as well. And you know, what happens is when you just have that just a, a, a whatever, you feel the blank. Whether it's just a kiss, whether it's just a hug, when, when you just have that just, what happens is your eyes begin to open. Your eyes begin to realize, hey, you know what, I didn't die, let me go a little further. Hey, that wasn't so bad. Let me just have a little bit more. Hey, you know what? I, I didn't get hurt that much. I can still make it out to church. Hey, you know what? I, I can still make it out to morning prayer. Hey, you know what? I can still read my Bible without the conviction or the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Let me just go a little further. And that's exactly what the devil wants us to do, church. He wants us to open our eyes and see the other options and opportunities that are out there as well. Regardless of what it is, regardless of how sweet it may be for that season, you know, the devil says, hey, you know, if you just open your eyes, if you just see, if you just open your eyes and, and realize that, hey, it's not as bad as people have told you it would be, then you can go a little bit further. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 says, do you, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicator, nor idolater, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. There's many things that are named on this list. Yeah. Many things. None of these people, none of these people that die or are involved in these things will inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. None of them will inherit. But hey, you know what? I haven't died just yet. I might as well carry on fornicating. I haven't died yet, just yet, let me just carry on scheming and lying. I haven't died just yet, let me just carry on doing whatever I do. Because I haven't died just yet. The devil wants to open our eyes, church. He wants to open our eyes so that we see the opportunity, so that we see the options that are out there. So that we can say to ourselves, you know what, it's not as bad as the Bible says it is. Let me go in a little bit further. Let me take another step closer. Yeah. But what happens is, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Relationships can also kill us on the wrong battlefield. Yeah, right. You know, I, I knew a guy when I was in the Hackney church. Uh, he had destiny written all over him. A great guy, a very, very good person, you know, and uh, I remember even uh, in church, uh, he was given a word, hey, be careful of the people that you listen to, be careful of the people that you hang around with. Mm -hmm. And then the whole happening situation happens and, and people begin to start speaking. Oh yeah, I knew that this church was funny, oh I knew that, da, da, da. and there's many different things that are being said and I'm thinking to myself, wow. The rebellious voices are really speaking loud now. They were very quiet a second ago. And all of a sudden, people are falling away. People are deciding to do other things. You know, um, me and my family, we go over to, to the Walthamstow Church and we find refuge there. And what happens is we're, we're calling people, we're asking people, hey, come over with us, find refuge as well. And this person, this guy that I'm talking about, he, he's listening to the voices that are also on the outside as well as the voices that are on the inside that are telling him to stay. And he decides to go because of the people that he listens to. Mm -hmm. See, the reality is, church, our relationships want to keep us at a place of comfort. Of, of, of comfort. And that place of comfort is where God can't challenge you, is where God can't stretch, or where God can't move in your life. 
our relationships at times can keep us at a place where we can say, hey, you know what? I can dance with the devil and I'm expecting not to get hurt. I can dance along with all sorts of madness and I'm expecting not to get hurt. But the reality is that when you dance with the devil, you're going to get hurt. When you mess around with things that you're not meant to be messing around with, you're going to get hurt. There's going to be moments, there's going to be times when you're going to say to yourself, hey, I'm okay now, let me just listen, because this person is a real close friend of mine, but the reality is that that close friend can also bring me to hell. Fear also, church, can bring us or can kill us on the wrong battlefield. There was a a king named Sisera, uh, and uh, he was fighting against the Israelites. So he's gone out onto battle against the Israelites, and the Israelites there, they're they're praying, they're waiting for confirmation for God to speak to them so that they can go out and fight. So they're praying. As soon as God gives them that confirmation through Deborah, they go out and they fight upon uh, on the battlefield and they get the victory. And as they're winning, this king is saying, Hey, you know what? My army is losing. Let me run away in fear. So he decides to run. And what he end where he ends up is at a, at a let me start again. Where he ends up is at a tent of this young lady named Jael. And in uh, Judges 4, 21, 21, it says, Then Jael, Haber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And he went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Sometimes fear can bring us to places where we shouldn't be dying. That man should have died out on the battlefield, but he ends up dying in the peg in the hands of of somebody else's wife. He ends up sneaking himself into a tent and he ends up dying because of fear. Fear can sometimes bring you to places where you don't need to be and it can end up killing you when you don't need to be killed. Discontentment can also kill us on the battlefield, church. Matthew 27, 5, it says, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. This is Judas, where he decides to say, Hey, you know what? Let me betray Jesus. I walked with God. I walked with the person that can bring eternal life. But let me go and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And then he realizes what he's done moments later and he says, hey, you know what? Is there a way that I can trade it back? Is there a way that I can re... Is there a way that I can rewind the time back? But it's all too late. Because of his greed, because of his discontentment, he decides to trade Jesus and he realizes what he's done and he hangs himself. Discontentment can kill us on the wrong battlefield. Acts 5, verse 5, it says, Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last breath, So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And in verse 10 it says, Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last breath. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. This is Sapphira and Ananias. This is the story of these two that had brought uh, apparently all that they had that they had acquired from selling their house to God, to the kingdom of God. And yet what they say is, you know, I swear this is all that we've done, all that we've acquired. And what happens is God says to Peter, you know, these people are lying. Judge them here, judge them right now. And that's exactly what Peter does. He challenges them and they die there on the spot. See, these things can easily distract or or, um, disrupt our concentration or our focus when it comes to the kingdom of God. These are stories. These are real stories, church. Things that happen in the Bible, you know, but what about our life? You know, if we can look and we can uh, dissect and we can think about the things that are distracting us from living for God, or we can think about the things that are, uh, that are trying to grab our focus rather than fighting the fight of faith, rather than fighting the right battle, where do we stand? Yeah. What happens? What comes to mind when it speaks about fighting the right battle? Lastly, I want to speak about uh, rerouting, signs of danger. A lot of times we can realize when we're lost 
You know, I, I remember when I was driving one time and I ended up uh, up in, I believe it was uh, Potter's Bar. I, I don't know how I ended up there. I, I went through some country road. I, I was trying to get to Edmonton, by the way. And I ended up driving through and I'm thinking, I'm sure this is the right direction. And, and I ended up in Potter's Bar and I realized, okay, uh, I've got to start asking people for direction. Sometimes you realize very quickly that you're lost. You know, but spiritually, it takes a lot, a little bit more. It takes a lot more at times. The, the beggar goes to heaven. But what I realize as I'm reading the story is that the rich man, no one ever disturbed him. He lived his lavish lifestyle. He lived good, but the beggar was disturbed by dogs. The dogs came, the, the scripture says, and they licked his wounds. You know, the enemy doesn't kick a dead dog. Yeah. He disturbs people that are living right for God. Yeah. He disturbs people that are doing the right thing. When you're doing the right thing, expect to get disturbed. Expect to, 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 get, um, to, to get assaulted. Expect the, the enemy to come and push you left and right. But when you're a dead dog, you should question yourself. If, you're a, if, if nothing is happening, if you know that there is no fight that's taking place there, you should question I might even say, there's God even moving in my life because the reality is God doesn't just doesn't just watch and just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to I'm, I'm going to watch my people perish. No, but what He says, I'm going to allow certain things to take place in your life, and I'm going to allow these things to happen so that you're able to grow, so that you're able to live for Me correctly. The enemy doesn't kick a dead dog. Luke 15, 17 to 18 says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. You know, this uh, prodigal son, he realized that he's in the wrong place. Hey, you know, I shouldn't be where I am today. I've realized now, sometimes in life, we, life can take us to places where, where, where we end up in, in the lowest of lows, and that's when we realize I've gone wrong. But the Bible is, is, is there to correct us, it's there to show us signs of danger, to say, hey, you know what, if you carry on going this route, this is what's going to happen. If we listen and if we take here, uh, adhere to, to what God is trying to say to us, we don't have to go to the lowest of low uh, places for us to realize that we've gone wrong in life. We don't have to be down in the dumps, we don't have to be trying to eat pig's foods for us to realize that, hey, we're in a bad situation and now I want to get right with God. We don't have to live that sort of life. We don't have to go to those sort of places for us to realize. Josiah saw the mess that the children of Israel were in. And he says to himself, let's go back to worshiping the God of Israel. He realized that they were in a mess. But he said, let's go back to worshiping the God of Israel. John 6, 68 to 69, it says that Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Mm. You know, in this part, Jesus is, is telling them, hey, you know what? There's going to be things that are going to be difficult that you're going to have to deal with. There's going to be things that are hard that you're going to have to deal with. And as, as Jesus is preaching, people are walking away and saying, I don't want that life for me. That's not the portion that I want in my life. People have walked away now. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, do you guys want to walk away as well? And then Simon Peter says, where else can we go? You know, where else am I going to find the right strategy to fight in this battlefield? Where else am I going to find the right words, the right artillery? Where else am I going to go to fight the right battle? It's only you, God, that has eternal life. It's only you that I can find the armor to fight the right battle in this world. Jesus has the keys to his kingdom. It's only through him that we can find that. Someone once said, destiny isn't 
just where you're going, but it's who you're going to be. If I flip that and I said, destiny isn't just who you're going to be, but it's also where you're going. Destiny for your life has an address. It's taking you somewhere. If you're stagnant, if you're staying where you're at, if you're saying, I'm happy to be where I am, I'm happy to just come to church, I'm happy to just be involved, there's a bit more to it, church. Destiny is a place where God is taking you to. Destiny is a place where how God is shaping and molding your life. Amen. You know, for us to find the right strategy, I want us to, to remember three things for us to keep our minds uh, focused on the right battle. The first thing is find faithful soldiers to fight the side. Find someone that's faithful. Find someone that you can say, hey, you know what? You're going to help me through my battles. Because we can't do it alone, church. We can't isolate ourselves because that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to isolate yourself so that you're able to fight on your own. But God has called us to fellowship with, among, with each other. God has called us to be with each other so that we're able to fight with each other. It's not about isolating yourself. It's not about going into this fight on your own. Second thing, let the Lord himself become your defense. See, when we resist Satan, when we resist and we fight against him, you know, sometimes it can make us weak in the battlefield. It can make us weary in the battlefield. And that's when we turn to ourselves and we say, hey, you know what? I've got to let God get involved in this. I've got to let God get involved. And how you allow God to get involved? You go on your hands and knees and you begin to pray. You begin to ask God for strength in the battle. You begin to allow God to take control. You begin to allow God to be your defense rather than you fighting for yourself. And lastly, just it's quite similar to the second point actually. That is, we don't fight this battle in our own strength. You don't fight this battle. Ephesians 6, 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We take up the armor of who? The armor of God. Because it's in God's strength that we have victory. It's in God's strength that you can, that you can stay focused, that you can keep your mind on the battlefield. As you focus on what God wants you to do, as you focus on what God is saying rather than what you feel and think, or what situations are happening on the outside around you, then you say to yourself, hey, you know what, God, you're involved. I'm going to allow you to direct me. I'm going to allow you to shape my life. See, Josiah, at the end, uh, in the scripture that we read at the beginning, he didn't allow God to speak into his life. He was at a high place. He was at a good place, but he never allowed God to continue to speak to him. He said, hey, you know what? I'm going to go about it my own way. And that's not what God has for us, church. He doesn't want us to go about it our own way. Yeah. He wants us to hear his words. At 29, 11. Jesus, Lord, God says, you know, I have a future and a hope for you. There's a promise there for your life. But it's about, are we staying connected? Are we allowing God to speak into our minds? Are we speaking to others? Are we allowing others to speak into our lives? Because that's how we get through. That's how we continue to fight on the right battlefield church. Anyway, with that, can I bring your head bowed? Every eye closed. Just in respect to God, in respect to your name, every head bowed and every eye closed. Amen. You may be here this evening, this afternoon rather, and you don't know God, you don't know Jesus. God loves you. He wants to see you make it into heaven. And you may have done things in the past where you said, you know what? I know I've violated God. I know I've done something wrong against God. And these things are called sin. And the Bible says, the soul that sins shall surely die. You've sinned against God. 
Il dit des œuvres, prenez chemin. Hey, you know what? Everybody else has done it as well. Yes, we all deserve a punishment. The Bible says that we've all fallen short of God's glory. 